This continues our tale of Terran, the assistant pig keeper. Each part will consist of two chapters. The Black Cauldron was written by Lord Alexander and published by Dell Publishing Company, Incorporated. I'm glad you've come back to listen. Now sit round as Papa Bear tells a story. Chapter 1. The Council at Caradalban. Autumn had come too swiftly. In the northernmost realms of Prydain, many trees were already re leafless, and many the branches clung the ragged shapes of empty nests. To the south, across the river Great Avron, the hills shielded Caradalban from the winds, but even here the little farm was drawing in on itself. For Terran, the summer was ending before it had begun. That morning, Dalbin had given him the task of washing the oracular pig. Had the old enchanter ordered him to capture a fully gro grown Gwythaint, Terran would gladly have set out after one of the vicious winged creatures. As it was, he filled the bucket at the well and trudged reluctantly to Henwen's enclosure. The white pig, usually eager for a bath, now squealed nervously and rolled on her back in the mud. Busy struggling to raise Henwen to her feet, Terran did not notice the horseman until he had reined up at the pen. You there, pig boy! The rider, looking down at him, was a youth, only a few years older than Terran. His hair was tawny, his eyes black and deep-set in a pale, arrogant face. Though of excellent quality, his garments had seen much wear, and his cloak was purposely draped to hide his threadbare attire. The cloak itself, Terran saw, had been neatly and painstakingly mended. He sat astride a rowan mare, a lean and nervous steed, speckled red and yellow, with a long, narrow head, whose expression was as ill-tempered as her master's. You, pig boy, he repeated. Is this Ker Dalbin? The horseman's tone and bearing nettled Terran, but he curbed his temper and bowed courteously. It is, he replied, but I am no pig boy, he added. I am Terran, assistant pig keeper. A pig is a pig, said the stranger, and a pig boy is a pig boy. Run and tell your master I am here, he ordered. Tell him that Prince Eladir, son of Penlecur. Henwen seized this opportunity to roll into another puddle. Stop that, Hen, Terran cried, hurrying after her. Leave off with that sow, Eladir commanded. Did you not hear me? Do as I say, and be quick about it. Tell Dalbin yourself, Terran called over his shoulder, trying to help Henwen from the mud. Or wait until I've done with my own work. Mind your impudence, Eladir answered, or you shall have a good beating for it. Terran flushed. Leaving Henwen to do as she pleased, he strode quickly to the railing and climbed over. If I do, he answered hotly, throwing back his head and looking Eladir full in the face. It will not be at your hands. Eladir gave a scornful laugh. Before Terran could spring aside, the roan lunged forward. Eladir, leaning from the saddle, seized Terran by the front of the jacket. Terran flailed his arms and legs vainly. Strong as he was, he could not break free. He was pummeled and shaken until his teeth rattled. Eladir then urged the roan into a gallop, hauled Terran across the turf to the cottage, and there, while chickens scattered in every direction, tossed him roughly to the ground. The commotion brought Dalbin and Call outdoors. The Princess Eleni hurried from the scullery, her apron, apron flying, and a cookpot still in her hand. With a cry of alarm, she ran to Terran's side. Eladir, without troubling to dismount, called to the white-bearded enchanter. Are you Dalbin? I have brought your pig boy to be thrashed for his insolent. Tut, said Dalbin, unperturbed by Eladir's furious expression. Whether he is insolent is one thing, and whether he should be thrashed is another. In either case, I need no suggestion from you. I am a prince of Penlecur, cried Eladir. Yes, 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 Dalbin interrupted with a wave of his brittle hand. I am quite aware of all that, and too busy to be concerned with it. Go, water your horse and your temper at the same time. You shall be called when you are wanted. Eladir was about to reply, but the enchanter's stern glance made him hold his tongue. He turned to the roan and urged her toward the stable. Princess Elmley and the stout bald-headed call, meantime, had been helping Terran, picking himself back up. "'You should know better, my boy, than to quarrel with strangers,' said Call good-naturedly. "'That's true enough,' Eleni said, "'especially if they're on horseback and you're on foot.' "'Next time I meet him,' Terran began. "'When you meet him again,' said Dalbin, "'you, at least, shall conduct yourself with as much restraint and dignity as possible, which, I allow, may not be very great, but you shall have to make do with it.' Be off now. The Princess Eleni can help you to be a little more presentable than you are at the moment. In the lowest of spirits, Terran followed the golden-haired girl to the scullery. 
He still smarted more from Eladir's words than from the drubbing, and he was hardly pleased that Elenmi had seen him sprawled at the feet of the arrogant prince. However did it happen? Elenmi asked, picking up a damp cloth and applying it to Terran's face. Terran did not answer, but grimly submitted to her care. Before Elenmi had finished, a hairy figure covered with leaves and twigs popped up at the window, and with great agility clambered over the sill. Woe and sadness, the creature wailed, loping anxiously to Terran. Gurgi sees smackings and waxings by strengthful lord. Poor kindly master, Gurgi is sorry for him. But there is news, Gurgi hurried on. Good news, Gurgi also sees the mightiest of princes, riding, yes, yes, with great gallopings on white horse, with black sword, what joy! What's that? cried Terran. Do you mean Prince Gwydion? It can't be. It is, said a voice behind him. Gwydion stood in the doorway. With a shout of amazement, Terran ran forward and clasped his hand. Elenmi threw her arms about the tall warrior, while Gurgi joyfully pounded the floor. The last time Terran had seen him, Gwydion wore the raiment of a prince of the royal house of Dawn. Now he was dressed simply in a hooded cloak of grey and a coarse, unadorned jacket. The black sword, Durnwin, hung at his side. "'Well met, all of you,' said Gwydion. "'Gurgi looks as hungry as ever. Elenmi, prettier than ever. And you, assistant pig-keeper,' he added, his lined and weathered face breaking into a smile. "'A little the worse for wear. Dalbin has mentioned how you came by those bruises.' "'I sought no quarrel,' Terran declared. "'But you found one nonetheless,' said Gwydion. "'I think that must be the way of it with you, Terran of Cairdalbin. "'No matter.' he said, stepping back and studying Terran closely through green-flecked eyes. Let me look at you. You have grown since last we met. Gwydion nodded his shaggy, wolf-gray hair in approval. I hope you have gained as much wisdom as height. We shall see. Now I must make ready for the council. Council? Terran cried. Dolben said nothing of a council. He did not even say you were coming here. The truth is, Elenie put in, Dalbin hasn't been saying much of anything to anybody. You should understand by now, said Gwydion, that of what he knows, Dalbin tells little. Yes, there is to be a consul, and I have summoned others to meet us here. I am old enough to sit in a council of men, Terran interrupted excitedly. I have learned much. I have fought at your side. I have... Gently, gently, Gwydion said. We have agreed you shall have a place, though manhood, he added softly, with a trace of sadness, may not be all that you believe. Gwydion put his hands on Terran's shoulders. Meanwhile, stand ready. Your task will be given soon enough. As Gwydion had foretold, the rest of the morning brought many new arrivals. A company of horsemen soon appeared and began to make camp in the stubble field beyond the orchard. The warriors, Terran saw, were armed for battle. His heart leaped. Surely this, too, had to do with Gwydion's counsel. His head spun with questions, and he hurried toward the field. He had not gone halfway when he stopped short in great surprise. Two familiar figures were riding up the pathway. Terran raced to meet them. Fluter! he called, while the bard, his beautiful harp slung over his shoulder, raised a hand in greeting. And Dolly, is that really you? The crimson-haired dwarf swung down from his pony. He grinned broadly for an instant, then assumed his customary scowl. He did not, however, conceal the glint of pleasure in his round, red eyes. Dolly! Terran clapped the dwarf on his back. I never thought I'd see you again, that is, really see you, not after you gained the power to be invisible. Huff, snorted the leather-jacketed dwarf. Invisible. I've had all I want of that. Do you realize the effort it takes? Terrible. It makes my ears ring. And that's not the worst of it. Nobody can see you, so you get your toes stepped on, or an elbow jabbed in your eye. No, 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 not for me. I can't stand it anymore. And you, Fluter, Terran cried as the bard dismounted. I've missed you. Do you know what the council is about? That's why you're here, isn't it? And Dolly, too? I know nothing about councils, muttered Dully. King Idleg commanded me to come here, a special favor to Gwydion. But I can tell you right now, I'd rather be back home in the realm of the Fair Folk, minding my own business. In my case, said the bard, Gwydion happened to be passing through my kingdom, purely by chance, it seemed, though now I'm beginning to think it wasn't. He suggested I might enjoy stopping down at Carrot Alban. He said, uh, good old Dolby was going to be there, so of course I set out immediately. I'd been uh, giving up on being a bard, Fluter continued, and had settled quite happily as a king again. Really, it was only to oblige Gwydion. At this, two strings of his harp snapped with a resounding twang. Fluter stopped immediately and cleared his throat. Yes, well, uh, he added, the truth of it is, I was 
perfectly miserable. I'd have taken any excuse to get out of that damp, miserable castle for a while. A council, you say? I was hoping it might be a harvest festival, that I'd need be needed to provide the entertainment. Whatever it is, Tyrion said, I'm glad you're both here. I'm not, grumbled the dwarf. When they start talking about good old Dolly this, good old Dolly that, watch out. It's for something disagreeable. I warn you. As they made their way to the cottage, Fluter looked around with interest. Well, well, do I see King Smoit's banner over there? He's here at Gwydion's request, too, no doubt. Just then, a horseman cantered up and called to Fluter by name. The bard gave a cry of pleasure. That's a Don, son of the chief bard Tellison, he told Terran. Caradalbin is indeed honored today. The rider dismounted and Fluter hastened to present his companions to him. Adon, Terran saw, was tall, with straight black hair that fell to his shoulders. Though, vo though of noble bearing, he wore the garb of an ordinary warrior, with no ornament, save a curiously shaped iron brooch at his collar. His eyes were gray, strangely deep, clear as a flame, and Terran sensed that little was hidden from Adon's thoughtful and searching glance. "'Well met, Terran of Caradalbin, and Dolly of the Fair Folk,' said Adon, clasping their hands in turn. "'Your names are not, among the, not unknown among the bards of the North.' Then you two are a bard? asked Terran, bowing with great respect. Adon smiled and shook his head. Many times my father has asked me to present myself for initiation, but I choose to wait. There is still much I hope to learn, and in my own heart I do not feel myself ready. One day, perhaps, I shall be. Adon turned to Fluter. My father sends greetings and asks how you fare with the harp he gave you. I can see it wants for repair, he added with a friendly laugh. Yes added admitted fluter i do have trouble with it now and again i can't help uh adding color to the facts most facts need it so badly but every time i do he sighed looking at the two broken strings this is the result be of good cheer said adon laughing wholeheartedly your gallant tears are worth all the harp strings in pride Ain. and you Terran and dolly must promise to help tell me more of your famous deeds but first i must find lord gwydion Taking leave of the companions, Adon mounted and rode on ahead. Fluter looked after him with affection and admiration. It can be no small matter if Adon is here, he said. He is one of the bravest men I know, that and more, for he has the heart of a true bard. Some day we will surely see his greatest accomplishments. You can mark my words. And our names are indeed known to him? Terran asked. And there have been songs about us? Fluter beamed. After our battle with the Horned King, yes, I did compose a little something, a modest offering. But it's gratifying to know it has spread. As soon as I fix these wretched strings, I'll be delighted to let you hear it. Soon after midday, when all had refreshed themselves, Call summoned them to Delvin's chamber. There, a long table had been placed with seats on either side. Terran noticed the Enchanter had even made some attempt to at straightening up the disorder of ancient volumes, crowding the room. The Book of Three, the heavy tome filled with Dolben's deepest secrets, had been set carefully at the top of a shelf. Terran glanced up at it, almost fearfully, sure that it held far more than Dolben ever chose to reveal. The rest of the company had begun to enter, when Fluter took Terran's arm and drew him aside as a dark-bearded warrior swept by. "'One thing you can be sure of,' the bard said under his breath. "'Gwydion isn't planning a harvest festival. Do you see who's here?' The dark warrior was richly attired, more so than any of the company. His high-bridged nose was falcon-like, his eyes heavy-lidded but keen. Only to Gwydion did he bow. Then, taking his seat at the table, he cast a cool glance of appraisal on those around him. "'Who is he?' whispered Terran, not daring to stare at this proud and regal figure. "'King Morgant of Madoc," answered the bard. "'The boldest war-leader in Pridain, second only to Gwydion himself. He owes allegiance to the House of Don." He shook his head in admiration. They say he once saved Gwydion's life. I believe it. I've seen that man in battle. All ice. Absolutely fearless. If Morgan's to have a hand in this, something interesting must be stirring. Oh, listen. It's King Smoit. You could always hear him before you see him. A bellow of laughter resounded beyond the chamber, and in another moment, a giant red-headed warrior rolled in at the side of a dawn. He towered above all in the chamber, and his beard flamed around a face so scarred with old wounds it was impossible to tell where one began and another ended. His nose had been battered to his cheekbones, his heavy forehead was nearly lost in a fierce triangle of eyebrows, 
and his neck seemed as thick as Terran's waist. What a bear, said Fluter with an appreciative chuckle. But there's not a grain of harm in him. When the lords of the southern Cantrevs rose against the Sons of Dawn, Smoit was one of the few who stayed loyal. His kingdom is Cantrev Catafor. Smoit stopped in the middle of the chamber, threw back his cloak, and hooked his thumbs into the enormous bronze belt which strained to bursting around his middle. Hello, Morgant, he roared. So they've called you in, have they? He sniffed ferociously. I smell bloodletting in the wind. He strode up to the stern war leader and fetched him a heavy cloud on the shoulder. Have a care, said Morgant with a lean smile that showed only the tips of his teeth. That it will not be yours. Ho! Ho! King Smoit bellowed and slapped his massive thighs. Very good. Have a care it will not be mine. Never fear, you icicle. I have enough to spare. He caught sight of Fluter. And another old comrade! He roared, hurrying to the bard and flinging his arms about him with such enthusiasm that Terran heard Fluter's ribs creak. My pulse! He cried. My body and bones! Give us a tune to make us marry, you butter-headed harp scraper! His eye fell on Terran. What's this? What's this? He seized Terran with a mighty red-furred hand. A skinned rabbit. A plucked chicken. He is Terran, Dalbin's assistant pigkeeper, said the bard. I wish he were Dalbin's cook, cried Smoit. I've hardly lined my belly. Dalbin began to rap for silence. Smoit strode to his place after giving Fluter another hug. There may not be any harm in him, said Terran to the bard, but I think it's safer to have him for a friend. All the company now gathered at the table, with Dalbin and Gwydion at one end. Call at the other. King Smoit, overflowing his chair, sat on the enchanter's left, across from King Morgant. Terran squeezed in between the bard and Dully, who grumble grumbled bitterly about the table being too high. To the right of Morgant sat Adon, and beside him Eladir, whom Terran had not seen since morning. Dalbin rose and stood quietly for a moment. All turned toward him. The enchanter pulled on a wisp of beard. I am much too old to be polite, Dalbin said, and I have no intention of making a speech of welcome. Our business here is urgent, and we shall get down to it immediately. Little more than a year ago, as some of you have cause to remember, Dalbin went on, glancing at Terran and his companions. Auron, lord of Anuvan, suffered grave defeat when the Horned King, his champion, was slain. For a time, the power of the land of death was checked, but in Prydain, evil is never distant. None of us is foolish enough to believe Aron would accept a challenge without defeat. Dalvin continued, I had hoped for a little more time to ponder the new threat to Anuvan. Time, alas, will not be granted. Aron's plans have become all too clear. Of them, I ask Lord Gwydion to speak. Gwydion rose in turn. His face was grave. Who has not heard of the Cauldronborn, the mute and deathless warriors, who serve the Lord of Anuvan? These are the stolen bodies of the slain, steeped in Aron's cauldron, to give them life again. They emerge as implacable as death itself, their humanity forgotten. Indeed, we are no longer men, but weapons of murder in this case, in thrall to Aron forever. In this loathsome work, Gwydion went on, Aron has sought to despoil the graves and barrows of fallen warriors. Now... Throughout Prydain, there have been strange disappearances, men suddenly vanishing to be seen no more, and Cauldronborn appear where none has been before. Auron has not been idle. As I have now learned, his servants dare to strike down the living and bear them to Anuvan to swell the ranks of his deathless host. Thus, death begets death. Evil begets evil. Terran shuddered. Outdoors, the forest burned crimson and yellow. The air was gentle as though a summer day had lingered beyond its season but Gwydion's words chilled him like a sudden cold wind. Too well he remembered the lifeless eyes and livid faces of the cauldron-born, their ghastly silence and ruthless swords. To the meat of it, cried Smoit. Are we rabbits? Are we to fear these cauldron slaves? There will be meat enough for you to chew on, answered Gwydion with a grim smile. I tell you now, none of us has ever set on a more perilous task. I ask your help, for I mean to attack Anuvan itself to seize Auron's cauldron and destroy it. Chapter 2. The Naming of the Tasks Terran started from his chair. The chamber was utterly silent. King Smoit, about to say something, remained open-mouthed. Only King Morgant showed no sign of amazement. He sat motionless, eyes hooded, a curious expression on his face. There is no other way, said Gwydion. While the cauldron-born cannot be slain, we must prevent their number from growing. 
Between the power of Anuvan and our own strength, the balance is too fine. As he gathers fresh warriors to him, Aron reaches his hands closer to our throats. Nor do I forget the living, foully murdered and doomed to bondage, even more foul. Until this day, Gwydion continued, only the High King Math and a few others have known what has been in my mind. Now that you have all heard, you are free to go or stay as it pleases you. Should you choose to return to your cantrevs, I will not deem your courage less. But I will, shouted Smoite. Any way-blooded pudding guts who fears to stand with you have, will have me to deal with. Smoit, my friend, replied Gwydion firmly, but with affection. This is a choice to be made without persuasion from you. No one stirred. Gwydion looked around and then nodded with satisfaction. You do not disappoint me, he said. I had counted on each of you for your tasks, which will be clear later. Terran's excitement crowded out his fear of the cauldron-born. It was all he could do to swallow his impatience and not ask Gwydion then and there what his task would be. For once, he wisely held his tongue. Instead, it was Fluter who leaped to his feet. Of course, cried the bard. I saw the whole thing immediately. You'll need warriors, naturally, to fetch out that disgusting cauldron. But you'll need to bard to compose the heroic chance of victory. I accept. Delighted. I choose you, Gwydion said, not unkindly, more for your sword than for your harp. How's that? asked Luter, his brow wrinkled in disappointment. Oh, I see, he added, brightening. Yes, well, I don't decide, deny a certain reputation along those lines. A flam is always valiant. I have slashed my way through thousands. He glanced uneasily at the harp. Well, uh, shall we say numerous enemies? I hope you will all be as eager to accomplish your tasks once you are set out, said Gwydion, drawing a sheet of parchment from his jacket and spreading it on the table. We meet at Caer Dalban, not for safety, he went on. Dulbin is the most powerful enchanter in Prydain. And here, we are under his protection. Caerdalbin is the only place Aron dares not attack, but it is also the most suitable to begin our journey to Anuvin. With a finger, he traced a direction northwest from the little farm. Great Avern is shallow at this season, he said, and may be crossed without difficulty. Once across, it is an easy progress through Cantra of Catafor, realm of King Smoit, to the forest of Idris lying south of Anuvin. From there, we can go quickly to Dark Gate. Terran caught his breath. Like all the company, he had heard of Dark Gate, the twin mountains guarding the southern approach to the Land of Death. Though not as mighty as Mount Dragon, at the north of Anuvin, Dark Gate was treacherous with its sharp crags and hidden drops. It is difficult passage, Gwydion continued, but the least guarded, as Kal, son of Kalfruer, will tell you. Kal rose to his feet. The old warrior, with his shining bald head and huge hands, looked as if he would prefer battle to discoursing in council. Nevertheless, he grinned broadly at the company and began to speak. We are going, as you say, through Aron's back door. The cauldron stands on a platform in the Hall of Warriors, which is just beyond Dark Gate, as I well remember. The entrance to the hall is guarded, but there is a rear portal, heavily bolted. One man might open it to others if, like Dolly, he could move unseen. I told you I wouldn't like it, Dully muttered to Terran. This business of turning invisible? Gift? A curse. Look where it leads. Humph. The dwarf snorted ir irritably, but made no further protest. It is a bold plan, Gwydion said, but with bold companions it can succeed. At Dark Gate, we shall divide into three bands. The first shall number Dully of the Fair Folk, Kal, son of Kalfur, Fluter Flam, son of Godo, and myself. With us will be six of Morgan's strongest and most valiant warriors. Dolly, invisible, will enter first to draw the bolts and to tell us how Aron's guards are posted. Then we shall breach the portal and seize the cauldron. At the same time, on my signal, the second band of King Morgant and his horsemen will attack Dark Gate, seemingly in great strength, to sow confusion and to draw away as many of Aron's forces as possible. King Morgant nodded and for the first time spoke. His voice, though ice-edged, was mesurge and courteous. I rejoice that we are at last decided to strike directly against Oron. I myself would have undertaken to do so long before this, but I was bound to await the command of Lord Quidian. But now I say this, continued Morgant. While your plan is sound, the path you choose is not suitable for quick retreat, should Oron pursue you. There is no shorter way to Caerdalban, Gwydion answered, and here is where the cauldron must be brought. 
we must accept the risk. However, if we are too sharply pressed, we shall take refuge at Karakadarn, stronghold of King Smoit. To this end, I ask King Smoit to stand ready, with all of his warriors near the forest of Idris. What? roared Smoit. Keep me from Anuvan. He struck the table with his fist. Do you leave me sucking my thumbs? Let Morgant, that black-bearded, cold-blooded, slippery-scaled pike, play rear guard. Morgant gave no sign of hearing, heard Smoit's outburst at all. Gwydion shook his head. Our success depends on surprise and swift movement, not numbers. You, Smoit, must be our firm support, should our plans go awry. Your task is no less important. The third band will wait us near Dark Gate to guard our pack animals, secure our retreat, and to serve as the need demands. They will be Adon, son of Talison, Terran of Caradalban, and Elidir, son of Panlacur. Elidir's voice rose quickly and angrily. Why must I be held back? Am I no better than a pig boy? He is untried, a green apple. Untried? Terran shouted, springing to his feet. I have stood against the cauldronborn with Gwydion himself. Have you been better tried, Prince Patchcloak? Elidir's hand flew to his sword. I am a son of Penlucur and swallow no insults from... Silence, commanded Gwydion. In this venture, the courage of an assistant peakkeeper weighs as much as that of a prince. I warn you, Elidir, curb your temper or leave this council. And you, Gwydion added, turning to Terran. You have repaid anger with a childish insult. I had thought better of you. Moreover, both of you shall obey Adon in my absence. Terran flushed and sat down. Elidir, too, took his place again, his face dark and brooding. Let us end our meeting, said Gwydion. I shall speak with each of you later, and at more length. Now I have matters to discuss with Call. At dawn tomorrow, be ready to ride for Anuvin. As the company began leaving the chamber, Terran stepped beside Elidir and held out his hand. In this task, we must not be enemies. Speak for yourself, Elidir answered. I have no wish to serve with an insolent pig boy. I am a king's son. Whose son are you? So you have stood against the cauldron born, he scoffed. And with Gwydion, you lost no chance to make that known. You boast in your name, Terran replied. I take pride in my comrades. Your friendship with Gwydion is no shield to me, said Elidir. Let him favor you all he chooses, but hear me well. In my company, you will take your own part. I shall take my own part, Terran said, his anger rising. See that your, you take yours as boldly as you speak. Adon had come up beside him. Gently, friends. I thought the battle was against Auron, not among ourselves. He spoke quietly, but his voice held a tone of command as he turned his glance from Terran to Elidir. We hold each other's lives in our open hands, not in clenched fists. Terran bowed his head. Elidir, drawing his mended cloak about him, stalked from the chamber without a word. As Terran was about to follow Adon, Delbin called him back. "'You are an excellent pair of hotbloods,' the demander remarked. "'I have been trying to decide which of you is the more muddled. It is not easy,' he yawned. "'I have, shall have to meditate on it.' "'Elidir spoke the truth,' Terran replied bitterly. "'Whose son am I? I have no name but the one you gave me. Elidir is a prince.' "'Prince he may be,' said Dalbin, "'yet perhaps not so fortunate as you. "'He is the youngest son of old Penlacur in the northern lands. "'His eldest brothers have inherited what little there was of family fortune, "'and even that is gone. "'Elidir has only his name and his sword, "'though I admit he uses them both with something less than wisdom. "'However,' Dalbin went on, "'these things have a way of writing themselves. "'Oh, before I forget,' His robe flapping around his spindly legs, Dolben made his way to a huge chest, unlocked it with an ancient key, and raised the lid. He bent and rummaged inside. I confess to a certain number of regrets and misgivings, he said, which could not possibly interest you, so I shall not burden you with them. On the other hand, here is something I am sure will interest you, and burden you too, for the matter of that. Dolben straightened and turned. In his hands, he held a sword. Terran's heart leapt. He grasped the weapon eagerly his hands trembling so that he nearly dropped it. Scabbard and hilt bore no ornament. The craftsmanship lay in its proportion and balance. Though of great age, its metal shone clear and untarnished, and its very plainness had the beauty of true nobility. Terran bowed low before Dalbin and stammered thanks. Dalbin shook his head. Whether you should thank me or not, he said, remains to be seen. Use it wisely, he added. I only hope you have no cause to use it at all. 
What are its powers? Terran asked, his eyes sparkling. Tell me now, so that I may... Its powers? Dolman answered with a sad smile. My dear boy, this is a bit of metal hammered into a rather unattractive shape. It could have better been a pair pruning hook, or plow iron. Its powers, like all weapons, only those held by those who wield it. What yours may be, I can in no wise say. We shall make our farewells now, Dolbin said, putting a hand on Terran's shoulder. Terran saw for the first time how ancient was the Enchanter's face, and how careworn. I prefer to see none of you before you leave, Dolbin went on. Such partings are one thing. I would spare myself. Besides, later your head will be filled with other concerns, and you will forget anything I might tell you. Be off, and see if you can persuade Princess Elenry to gird you with the sword, now that you have it, he sighed. I suppose you may as well just observe the formalities anyways. Elenry was putting away earthen bowls and dishes when Tyrion hurried into the scullery. Look, he cried. Dalbin gave me this. Gird it on me. I mean, if you please. Say you will. I want you to be the one to do it. Eleni turned to him to, in surprise. Why, yes, of course, she said, blushing. If you really... I do, cried Terran. After all, he added, you are the only girl in care, Dalbin. So that's it, Eleni retorted. I knew there was something wrong when you started being so polite. Very well, Terran of care, Dalbin. If that's your only reason, you can go find someone else, and I don't care how long it takes you. But the longer, the better. She tossed her head and began furiously drying a bowl. Now what's wrong? asked Terran, puzzled. I said please, didn't I? Do gird it on me, he urged. I promised to tell you what happened at the council. I don't want to know, answered Eleni. I couldn't be less inter interested. What happened? Oh, give me that thing. Deftly, she buckled the leather belt around Terran's waist. Don't think I'm going through all the ceremonies and speeches about being brave and invincible said Eleni. To begin with, I don't think they apply to assistant paykeepers, and besides, I don't know them. There, she said, stepping back. I must admit, she added, it does look rather well on you. Terran drew the blade and held it aloft. Yes, he cried. This is a weapon for a man and a warrior. Yes, 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 enough of that, cried Eleni, stamping her feet impatiently. What about the council? We're setting out for a Nuvin, Terran whispered excitedly. At dawn, to wrest the cauldron from Auron himself, the cauldron he uses to... Oh, why didn't you say so right away? Elenry cried. I don't have half enough time to get my things ready. How long will we be gone? I must ask Dolbin for a sword, too. Do you think I'll need... No, 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 Terran interrupted. You don't understand. This is a task for warriors. We can't be burdened with a, a girl. When I said we, I really meant... What? shrieked Elenry. And all this time, you let me think that... Care, Dalbin? Terran, I... You make me angrier than anyone I have ever met. Warrior, indeed. I don't care if you have a hundred swords. Underneath it all, you're an assistant pigkeeper, and if Gwydion's willing to take you, there's no reason he shouldn't take me. Oh, get out of my scullery! With a cry, Elenwy seized the dish. Terran hunched his shoulders and fled while earthenware shattered behind him. And that is the end of chapter two. Thank you for listening, and remember, have a good day. You deserve it.